We are an order with the contemplative order um, who live a hidden life of prayer. We get up at half past five and then the community will pray between six o'clock and seven o'clock in the morning. So our first act is to be in chapel before the Blessed Sacrament praying for an hour. We do vestments. We distribute altar breads to our diocese, the whole of the Birmingham diocese. We do printed cards, which might come on the camera because we're in a place where all our cards are done. So we print and um, sell cards. And we make our own habits, so everything I've got on is being made by the community. Except for shoes and socks, and <laughs> most of the other things have. The Word was made flesh. This is what Christmas is about. God's Word became man. No television, no radios, no telephones. And when I entered, there was no mobile phones, so it was... You suddenly found yourself very much away from all the media, television, everything. It was that silent stillness of karma, which can be quite stark when you enter. We actually ask people now, if they're entering, to put your phone away, get to learn to not have your phone on your hip. Hello and welcome to Shekinah Europe and our program Yes Lord. We are here today with Sister Mary Therese, a Carmelite sister here in Wolverhampton. So welcome sister. Thank you. <laughs> Lovely to be here. And yeah. to start off with, just tell us a little, about, a little bit about who you are and what you do here right now in this I'm monastery. a Carmelite sister. I'm also an extern sister, not an enclosed sister. And I've been in the community for 40 years. I was enclosed for many years, but due to family circumstances, I came out and I work on the extern. So I actually, I'm there in some ways to safeguard the community, their enclosure. I do shopping. I look after the extern part. I also help within the community. Um, we run different businesses and things. And I do people coming to the chapel, people who come to the monastery will usually meet me Sometimes the other sisters at the turn, but usually me. And sometimes we have people staying, so I will provide and serve them. Great. <laughs> and tell us a little bit about um, Carmelites themselves. What, what is your spirituality? What do you do? Uh, what do the enclosed sisters do maybe on a day-to-day -day life? What are their kind of activities? Why are they uh, in the convent? <laughs> right. So a Carmelite's life is one of prayer, and contemplation in service of the church. So we're, a, we're an order with the contemplative order um, who live a hidden life of prayer. I think I could say for myself and many who've entered, it's the call or vocation to actually live a life of prayer and sacrifice for the church. Mm. Not only seeking union with God yourself, but actually to be at the service of the church, of the world, of a hidden life of prayer for the world. And I think many sisters would say the same. They were drawn to Carmel through a calling, which um, vocation is, to that. Yes. And so on a kind of brief outline of a day-to-day -day life of a sister, what, do you, what time do you wake up to pray? Yeah. What do you yeah, eat? This, what do yeah. you do during yeah, the day? Yeah, they, they, we call it the horarium. And we get up at half past five. And then the community will pray between six o'clock and seven o'clock in the morning. So our first act is to be in chapel before the Blessed Sacrament praying for an hour. Then we have the divine office, which is divided through the whole day, which we're bound to say, the full office, which, which intersperses the whole day. From morning we have lords, vespers in the evening, then we have what the small office is in between throughout the day. So we come to the chapel to praise and pray to God. We, within this community, we have Mass at nine o'clock, which is a public service. We are, it's only not being public for COVID, but we're slowly getting back. Um, and then in between that, the sisters will work. Mm -hmm. So it's your daily work. It's either we're self-supporting. So to use an example, we do vestments. We distribute altar breads to our diocese, the whole of the Birmingham diocese. 
We do printed cards, which might come on the camera because we're in a place where all our cards are done. So we print and um, sell cards. And we make our own habits. So everything I've got on is being made by the community, except for shoes and socks, and <laughs> most of the other things have. Um, and we are self-supporting. And we grow our own fruit and vegetables as best we can. Mm -hmm. And we look after the elderly. So it's very much a self-supporting community. And most of the day is silence. So we work in silence, not rigidly, but so that we keep that presence and silence to be open to the Lord and to prayer. And we meet up twice a day for recreation when we all meet up or the community meet up. Mm -hmm. And we'll spend maybe half an hour in the in midday and then half an hour in the evening when all the sisters get together to talk and share. But otherwise, most of the day is silent. We keep that silent prayerfulness within the monastery. Prayerful silence of the, of the, uh, of the mouth and of the heart. Well, so, yes, the mouth. Sometimes if you read Holy Mother, she said, my mind is like wild horses. She had great difficulty in keeping that inner silence. But it is that inner interior, a wakefulness to God. It's actually that listening heart would be the word. If we're full of noise and chatter, you actually can't hear so well. So it's that listening to the Lord, that, but also turning the day into a, dedicating our day to a prayer, prayerfulness for the world. It's not just for us. We don't come like any of us. We're at the service of the church and the world for others. It's yes. not just our insulin about ourselves. That's so important. We're here to serve the church. Our Lord said, I did not come to be served, but to serve. And I think that's very much anybody entering Carmel is that sense of, because we're not out doing nursing or teaching, mm. we're actually doing our service within the community. I think anybody who's read St. Therese of Leisure, she turned every small act into an act of love. And I think that's a very powerful message for anybody, wherever we are. It doesn't, you don't have to be in a monastery to turn every one of your acts into an act of love and service for others and for the Lord if, and whatever your faith. Yes, that's a very beautiful, beautiful mm. message to share. Yeah. That showing love in the little things in our yeah. lives, in yeah. everything we do, offer it to God yeah. and for of love of the other person. I think I may have said to you when I was talking to you last week, um, Susanna, I always remember a quotation I read from... Mother Teresa of Calcutta, who was Saint, now St. Saint Teresa of Calcutta, who had a huge devotion to St. Therese. Mm -hmm. Also, she linked every one of our Carmels with one of her houses, because she said, we need your apostolic prayer to support our apostolic life. We need your prayer to feed our lives. And I remember a well-known story is one of the lay missionaries working with her was working on the streets of Calcutta. And she said, she found her crying. Mother Teresa found her crying. She said, what's the matter? And she said, there's so much to be done here. And I feel that I can't do anything. And that I'm not doing enough. There's so much need here. And Mother Teresa of Calcutta, and I don't know quite the quote exactly. She said, what is the ocean made up of water? And what is water made up of drops? And she said, Every drop of love we put into this work we are doing makes the ocean of love. And I've never, ever forgotten that because within I've been enclosed 28 years, so I know what it is. You don't see your prayers being answered. People may thank you or they might send you an email, but you don't see the result of your prayer. And it's so important to remember that that loving service, that hidden loving service with that faith produces the ocean of love out in the world. And my goodness, we need that at the moment. We definitely do. Mm. So thank you for introducing um, us to the Carmelites a little bit. Now, um, tell us a little bit about your personal journey to the Carmelites. So did you grow up w when, you, when you were younger? Did you grow up in a Catholic family, in a Catholic I, school? Um, I was, my mother was a convert. My father was a Catholic. Um, I grew up in Worcester and my mother's great devotion in becoming a convert was reading the autobiography of St. Therese. And that is where I got my name. My name is Mary Therese. And it actually came from St. Therese. My mother named me after St. Therese. Oh, wow. So, yes, yeah, so we had no idea when we moved to Wolverhampton 
that we were moving right next to a Carmel. My mother had always wanted to live near a Carmel. And when we moved here, we found out the Carmel was literally two minutes away from where I lived. So I always had that contact with Carmel. We had a lot of difficulties at home. Um, I won't go into personal detail about it, but a lot of difficulties. And by the time I was 12, I wouldn't say I'd given up my faith, but I rebelled against my faith, watching the example of my father. So I gave up my faith. Um, and I came back to my faith when maybe I was 16. Although nobody knew I actually wasn't practicing, I don't think my mother knew I wasn't going to Mass. <laughs> I um, knew I had to refine the Lord again, and I joined the charismatic group, and I started to pray more. And I was working, I worked in dentistry, and I had been praying between maybe 18 and 19, looking, asking God to guide me in my vocation. I didn't know where. I'd always come to Mass here, to the Carmel. My mother, when we had difficulties, and we did have a lot of difficulties at home, she would always come and ask the prayers of Carmel, always. So Carmel was always a hidden stream at the, you know, the behind the back, in the background of our life, of our life. Um, and when I got to 19, between 19 and 20, I just knew that God was calling me to a vocation in religious life. And I knew it was Carmel. Even though I was scared to death of doing it, I knew he was calling me to Carmel. And um, I entered when I was nearly 20. So how was, what was the process for you uh, like when, okay, I found out, I think God is calling me to join these sisters. What are the next steps? What did you do next? I think it wasn't just a process of, I came to see the sisters, but it was also an interior process of my own spirituality. I began to deepen my life in prayer. I began to try and go to Mass every day if I could. Yes. Within my own work, I remember I was working in a surgery and I took my Bible in <laughs> and I would keep it hidden because I shouldn't really had it in the surgery. <laughs> I kept it hidden. So in my lunch breaks, my I would do biblical reading. Um, so everything I did was actually leading to and discerning my own vocation. Most of my friends thought I was mad. Um, people thought that I wouldn't stay. I enjoyed life. I'd be out at nightclubs and bars and things. So I was enjoying life. And there's an interesting story that I was talking to Father Guy, our chaplain this morning. He said, tell the story about, it was a Christmas day and I was, after my lunch, I went out on my bike and I remember it vividly. And we'd had a wonderful lunch and they'd all been drinking after. And I'd been out at a nightclub the night before. I'd been, I think I'd been to a morning mass, come back home. And I remember going down to St. Michael's Church and walking in and the only one there was a priest named Canon Emery and he was praying in front of the crib. And I remember walking up to him, maybe I was 18, and saying, what is Christmas? Mm -hmm. Sort of, I, I was almost, everything had been celebration. And he pointed to the Jesus, the baby in the crib, and he went, the word was made flesh. This is what Christmas is about. God's word became man for humanity. And I'll never forget it. It was the beginning of me more and more searching Mm. interiorly as well as exteriorly, how I was living. So it wasn't just a sense of, I've got a vocation, I'm going to do it. It was actually step by step discerning where God wanted me. How was I living? Mm. What were my decisions? Um, I had a boyfriend, we actually had separated and his family thought I was crazy. And I had to make that decision to accept that they thought I was crazy, but I knew I had to answer this calling. Yes. Um, and even within my own family, I think my brothers thought, you know. Where did this come from? Well, yeah, yes, yes, because, yeah, because um, we weren't, by that point, my mother was very devout. Um, but the family, my brothers and sisters had all given up their faith. We all gave up on mass and then I came back. So none of my other brothers and sisters, and there were five of us who were practicing. I was the only one who came back to that deep journey of searching. So it was through great difficulty, really, within, I wouldn't go into personal, but it was through great difficulty that I started searching 
for God's journey for my life. Mm. I suppose you could say the will of God in my life, but I'd also say God's journey in my life, because that can everybody can say that all people in mean, all different faiths can say that the journey yes. that they're being called to in life. And, and I always knew it was service. I knew it was service. I didn't know quite what, but I knew it was service for humanity, um, which became my Carmelite vocation. That's beautiful, sister. So when you say kind of in your difficulties you found you, yourself searching more for, for God, it's almost like in your sufferings, without knowing, you were uniting yourselves to the suffering yeah, of Christ. Yes, I wouldn't have been able to actually discern that in word at the age of 18, I doubt. And there was a very prominent moment because I joined the Charismatics. I was told to join it um, by a friend. She said, you really want to join the Charismatic group? And I did. And I remember I went to see the priest there. He was a Father Canari from the Birmingham Diocese, a very charismatic priest. And I remember he said, he handed me a Bible and in it he wrote, this is God's love letter to man. I was only 16 or 17. This is God's love letter to man. And I always kept, I kept that Bible up to when I entered Carmel. Then I gave it to my friend who'd left her faith. So I handed her my Bible. So um, Passed it on. Yes, yes. So, um, so that gives you a little of my background into Carmel and my vocation. Thank you for sharing that. So... Once you've entered Carmel, you said you were first an enclosed sister. So tell us a little bit about your personal experience of being enclosed. Um, maybe some of the works that you did um, specifically uh, at, at the time. Yes. Um, th I remember entering. I remember my parents came with me when I entered. So entered through the enclosure. Very much like Therese, it was a very traumatic sense of leaving everything and entering the monastery. And the bizarre thing was me, was that from my, we've got cells, we call them cells on the top passage, which was up, right up three stories. I could see my, the, I could see the trees from my garden, from my house. So it was very bizarre knowing that I'd never go back there, that I totally left everything and entered the enclosure of the monastery. And as a, you've just asked about the life, so our whole day's planned. So we, our whole life is actually getting into the life so I had, would have an angel who keeps an eye on you and shows you the, the um, I'm trying to think of the word, um, the whole program of the day, how the whole horarium of the day goes. So I had an angel and then we're allocated to different offices. So I was working, making vestments, gardening because we grow our own fruit and vegetables, working in the kitchen. So all different um, cards we did. We used to do hand painting of cards in the early days. Now we've got a bit of printer. So all the cards were actually produced on the cassette the machine and all hand painted. It took hours. Um, and we sold them at Christmas and Easter and different times. We had the novitiate, so you'd have um, an office mistress teaching you the life, the charism of the order. I think the hardest thing I found was the silence. No television, no radios, no telephones. And when I entered, there was no mobile phones, so it was you suddenly found yourself very much away from all the media, television, everything. It was that silent stillness of karma, which can be quite stark when you enter. We actually ask people now, if they're entering, to put your phone away, get to learn to not have your phone on your hip. Yes. Get to learn not to have a television on and watching television all the time. I mean, we have lots, we have internet, for our work. Um, we have phones, simple phones, especially me as an extern, but the sisters inside, some of them have phones. But he was actually teaching people not to rely on these things mm. because we don't use them with them. We don't have television inside. We get to know all our news through, one of the sisters gets the news off the internet uh, for us. Um, up till recently, we had the papers where we, so we have an idea of what's going on, what needs prayer. And that, so we keep up to date with everything that's going on. We're not unaware of the needs of the world. Yes. Um, and we also, we give out, we help and support charities. That's another one of our, not specifically our mission, but we always give out. We, we've always supported Little Brothers in Wolverhampton for the homeless and people come for food, which regularly goes on or comes for things. 